Hello, uh, we're continuing on taking a look at some of the biggest ideas in uh, the, the notion of political justice. Uh, in Plato, uh, the idea was presented that a government's job is to look out for its subjects, not the people who are in fact in the government, right? Uh, that the proper uh, role of the ruler is to look after the interests of the subjects, not themselves, right? It's a very big idea, very, very important idea in uh, not only Western political thought, but the world's political thought. Uh, but here, uh, of course, it leaves out what exactly the government is supposed to do to look after the interests. What, what, what is in uh, people's interests that a government can give them? And so part of our question about political justice uh, or governmental justice is uh, what should a government do? What, should a, what is a just government supposed to be like? Right. And Hobbes is going to give us a sketch of that answer. And, and Hobbes is uh, one of my one of my very favorite uh, thinkers of this whole um, this whole unit, this whole year. I, I, I always enjoy Hobbes Day. So uh, without uh, further ado, here we go. Uh, this is, of course, a painting of Thomas Hobbes. Um, he, he lived from 1588 to 1679. And I want to highlight something uh, that uh, the Thirty Years' War, which takes place roughly between 1618 and 1648, uh, spans the majority of his adult life, right? So uh, the Thirty Years' War, um, if you uh, don't remember from you know, various history courses, things like that, or haven't had those yet, uh, the Thirty Years' War is one of the most destructive periods in all of human history. Um, it, was, it was bad. Um, uh, something, if I remember right, something like eight million uh, deaths due to you know various causes, you know violence and pestilence and famine and all that sort of stuff, um, and you know eight million at the time when the the, the, the Earth's population was much lower, um, it, it, it was it's really serious. I mean, so it's uh, uh, you know sort of on a per capita basis, it's it was it was again one of the most destructive periods uh, of, of of human history, and and uh, it's you know smack in the middle of Hobbes's uh, adult life. And so certainly uh, the way that Hobbes tends to approach his, uh, uh, his, his theories, uh, his theories are, are absolutely grounded in what's going on around him uh, and yet have enduring importance uh, for, um, for us today. Uh, he's famous for uh, his publication of the Leviathan. Uh, it's published in uh, 1651. Uh, Leviathan doesn't just describe the length of the book or its thickness. Um, it's, uh, you know, that's a, just a little bit of a joke. Uh, Hobbes also had a cartoon tiger named after him. Uh, you might remember the Calvin and Hobbes uh, uh, comic strips. Uh, Calvin is supposedly named after John Calvin. Uh, and the reason that uh, the cartoonist uh, 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 Sam Waterston uh, is it Sam Waterston? Something, Water, Bill Waterston, I think it was. Um, uh, the cartoonist, I think, I, I remember in an interview somewhere uh, saying that he picked those names because both of those um, thinkers had had something of a reputation for having a very bleak view of human nature. Um, <clears throat> and so certainly Hobbes does have that reputation. Um, and so very often you might see on, you know, little quizzes or something like that, you'll see, you know, uh, who thought that, you know, people were bad or violent or awful by nature and it's Thomas Hobbes or something like that. He, it's a, a very much a part of his reputation. Uh, I'll lay my cards on the table and say that I don't think that's entirely fair. Um, I don't think this uh, reputation is all that well deserved. I, I don't think he has a particularly bleak view of human nature. And I think we should judge him really by what he writes. And so we'll revisit that question once we, once we get through his account uh, of what a government is supposed to do and what it's supposed to be like. Uh, and, and honestly, uh, why have one at all? Okay. What Hobbes gives us is something that's uh, enduringly important. It's called a social contract theory. Uh, in a social contract theory, uh, th in this, in Hobbes gives us the first of its kind. Many other people have given various different kinds of social contract theories, but Hobbes's is really the first. Uh, any social contract theory operates in the following way, right? The first step of a social contract theory is to imagine life without any government, like you know, no rules, no, no, nobody's really in charge. There are no laws, there are no police, there are no kings, etc. Right? So no government, and this life without government uh, is called by philosophers the state of nature. So you're supposed to imagine the state of nature, and I want to uh, offer a clarification here. Uh, People like Hobbes, uh, later uh, Locke, who we'll talk about, uh, they present these imagined ideas of what the state of nature would be like. And sometimes people mistake them for saying something about 
history. And of course, neither of none of nobody who has uh, really proposed a social contract theory has been under the illusion that the way that they describe the state of nature actually describes any historical circumstances that ever happened, right? That's not really what they're up to. They know that they're imagining what life would be like without government, right? Uh, they know that like, if, if you look at the distant human past, we were always under at least some kind of social authority, if if nothing other than like, you know, family rules or clans or chieftains or something, right? There was always something. Um, and so again, these descriptions that these philosophers give of the state of nature, this is from imagining, right? What, what, what you know, what's going on rather than from, uh, uh, from, from some like historical research or something like that. This is entirely hypothetical uh, because the point of it is it's supposed to focus our attention on what matters. Uh, in fact, one one really productive way to think about the social about this method uh, of, of of thinking about a social contract theory is to think of it as the it's a wonderful life method, right? If you haven't seen it's a wonderful life, you've been under a rock for too long. Uh, you need to go and see it's a wonderful life. Okay, it's a, it's a classic of American cinema. Um, you know, consider that like you know. A, you can tell whoever you want. Oh, my professor said I have to watch this movie, right? It's it's on every channel for like you know uh, you know at all hours of the day around the Christmas season. Uh, but you can you can find it in other places at other times. So in any case, if you if you haven't seen it, the plot of the film is that uh, you know something sort of bad happens to a guy whose name is George Bailey, and uh, you know it, it's sort of an, a bit of an unfortunate turn, a bit of bad luck, and you know he starts to really doubt his life's direction and thinks you know he has some regrets about how things perhaps should have been, and he goes out to some bridge to. Try Try and kill himself by jumping off the bridge and then some angel comes down who doesn't really look very much like a classic angel looks like just a you know sort of a silly old man but but it's an angel right is you know i think his name's clarence or something like that and 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 what clarence does is is he sort of shows him what life would have been like in the town that he lived uh had he never been born right and so at the end of of the day right at the end of the movie in, in any case he comes to realize that he really has led as the movie says, a wonderful life, okay? So sometimes when you see what things would be like without something, that's when you see what's really important about it. So, you know, if you were able to see what life would have been like without you, you could see what your real importance has been to people. So, um, and that's certainly uh, the case here. So that's effectively what's going on. We're trying to imagine life without government to focus our attention on what's really important about it, right? And it helps us to answer the question, why should we have a government at all? And if we if we're going to have one, what what should it be like? And so when you when we imagine life without government, we're inevitably going to imagine certain kinds of problems, and that's what we want to list in step two of our social contract theory uh, method of thought. We say, okay, what sort of problems are there, right, with um, with uh, the state of nature? And then finally, we want to say, okay, let's see what how we could fix these problems. And usually the way to fix these problems is to have some sort of function of a government, right? You propose, okay, how about we have an, an institution, right? Uh, an organization, something like that does this or that or the other thing that would fix all these problems from not having uh, any such uh, organization or institution. Right. Uh, and then the idea is that if any reasonable person would agree to that, would agree to live in a, a, under under a government, because uh, usually they have to give up something right to live under a government, give up some sort of natural freedom. They have to consent to having some organization to some extent tell them what to do. Um, but if they would accept that bargain, uh, you know, uh, rationally speaking, well, then then the institution of government is is fundamentally just. It's fundamentally fair because it, it relies on something that sort of any ordinary person would agree to if they were thinking straight and if they sort of had all the facts before them. So this idea of the social contract theory is really, really important. And so let's get to uh, then Hobbes's notion of uh, what a social contract looks like, what the state of nature looks like, uh, and we'll, we'll think through it uh, in this order. So let's think along with Hobbes here and see, all right, what is the state of nature really like? What is it really like to live without any governments or other kind of social authority? And so this is the reason we call it the state of nature is because people are then in their sort of natural state. And again, I, I, this is a hypothetical. We're not making a claim about what history was like or what human beings lived like at some point in the past. That's not really the point here. We're, we're, we're thinking of what things would be like without any government, given that people are the way they are. 
And so the first thing uh, that Hobbes points out is he points out something about human nature, about the way that we are. And he says this, he says, nature has made people so equal in their physical and mental capacities that although sometimes we may find one who is obviously stronger in body or quicker of mind than another, yet taking all in all, the difference between one and another is not so great that one can claim to have any advantage of strength or skill or the like that can't just as well be claimed by some others. So this is the first thing he says about human nature. He says that people are generally evenly matched, taken as a whole. Yes, some people are stronger than others, but nobody is so strong that they can just have whatever they want without fear of anything from anybody. Some people are a little smarter than others, but nobody is so much smarter than everybody else that they can get whatever they want without fearing anything from anybody, right? In general, these sorts of things are spread out fairly evenly, and most people are very much like most other people. Right. So that's the first thing he says about human nature, um, and it doesn't seem particularly bleak or cynical to me. Right. So um, what follows from this natural equality? Right. Let's think through it a bit. So now imagine that here you are in the state of nature. You're all by yourself, right? But there's no rules. Okay. There's no government. There's nobody to tell you what to do. The world, as they say, is your burrito. Life is good. You walk around, you do what you do. You, you know, no, nobody can tell you you can't. Uh, you sort of, you know, enjoy the life in the wilderness. Maybe you grow a big beard, whatever. Maybe you go and pick some fruit and make a nice little pile of fruit because you're like, yeah, I might want some fruit later. So I'm going to make a little pile of it. So yeah, that's my pile of fruit. You know, nobody can tell me I can't, so the fruit's just there. It belongs to whoever takes it, right? That's the state of nature, baby. And uh, again, this seems to be sort of uh, a, a, an idyllic circumstance, right? It seems all great uh, until, right? I think, think to yourself, what could ruin this uh, little piece of paradise? Oh, somebody else, right? Now, keep in mind what Hobbes has said about the natural equality of people. Uh, look, people are very much like one another. So you don't know this person, but you know they're a person, right? And so if you think to yourself, roughly how strong are they? Right? Well, the correct answer is probably more or less as strong as you. Right? How smart do you suppose they are? Well, again, probably, give or, you know, more or less as smart as you. What sorts of things do they want? Well, probably the same kind of things you want. Maybe a little variation, but, you know, the basics are all there. And so if you really liked your little pile of fruit, what do you suppose they think about it? Well, they probably like it a lot, too. And in fact, as you notice, they've got their own little pile of fruit that looks very much like yours. And so you think, well, gosh, this person really does like more or less the same things I like. Again, that's not surprising. They're another person just like you. Well, so now what do you do? It seems like you've got a couple of choices, right? Now, of course, um, you know, you, you are armed, right? You don't walk around the state of nature without, a, you know, a nice shillelagh stick. So there you've got a, a little shillelagh stick, of course. Now, uh, because people are more or less equal, because people are very much like one another, uh, do you suppose this other person who's probably more or less just as smart as you are has gone out into the state of nature without their shillelagh? Well, of course not. OK, uh, they're certainly prepared, right, to, to, to deal violence or to you know, respond in kind. Um, and so what do you actually do? Do you do you attack them? Do you not attack them? Do you turn your back on them, go about your business? Do you you know, what do you do? All right. This is this is a uh, this is serious business here. Right. You know, you're talking, you know, uh, there's there's no rules. OK. And so it seems like you have two choices, right? You can either choose peace, that is, uh, not prepare to attack them, or plan to attack them, or not really prepare to defend yourself against the, you know, the first false move you see. Okay, that's you know, um, that's choosing peace. Or you could choose war. You could choose to, you know, either, you know, sort of wait for any kind of provocation and strike. Uh, you can be on the, you know, the, 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 you know, the immediate defensive, focusing all your attention on this person. Of course, they may find that to be threatening, um, but uh, you know, so be it, right? That's, you know, that's essentially war. So you're either going to decide you're going to be ready to fight, or you're not going to be uh, decide that fighting is really what you want to do. And so uh, those are your options.
Now, of course, what options does this other person have? Well, of course, same ones. They can choose war. They can choose peace. And so it seems like we can make a kind of uh, a kind of grid here. All right? We can see what happens if both of us choose war. We can see what happens if one of us chooses war and the other chooses uh, peace. Right? Well, we're going to sort of see, um, you know, if if we both choose war, whatever happens will be here in this box. Uh, if we if one of us chooses war, the other chooses peace. Right? It'll be there. If if they choose war, you choose peace. If uh, uh, you choose war, they choose peace, the outcome will be over here. And of course, if you both choose peace, the outcome will be sort of in here. So you see that, that there's a kind of table, right? It's kind of just turned a bit diagonally. And so if you both choose peace, I think it's pretty clear uh, that what happens is you kind of live and let live, right? Um, you know, you just sort of, uh, you know, do ordinary sorts of things. Uh, you go about your business, they go about their business, you eat your fruit, they eat their fruit, maybe you pick a little more, maybe they pick a little more, and you sort of, you know, maybe bump into each other and, you know, uh, whatever, right? It's That's it, kind of nice, right? It's live and let live. Well, um, what about uh, if, if the choices are a little bit different? Of course, if you choose peace and and your this, this other person chooses war, well, then this other person will kill you and take your fruit, right? That's that's how that works, okay? And they'll, they'll, they'll say, hey, I, you know, got a nice little windfall, an extra little pile of fruit, and I'm down one potential threat to my existence. Now, same, of course, uh, story if uh, we go in reverse, um, that if you choose war and they choose peace, then uh, you kill them and take their fruit. Uh, and you say, yay, I've got some more fruit, and I'm down one potential threat to my existence. And of course, um, if you uh, both choose uh, to fight it out, well, you'll fight it out. And of course, such a thing is very risky. Uh, perhaps uh, you will, uh, I mean, perhaps you'll win, perhaps you'll lose. But even if you win, you might be, you know, a, a victim of some life-changing injury, right? I mean, you, you might you might do enough damage to each other that you can't, you, neither of you can survive uh, the aftermath. Uh, and so what we're going to mark that as uh, is sort of a 50-50 at best. Right. Uh, it could very much be it could very well very easily be worse than a 50 50. It could be sort of everybody loses. OK, so when you look at this table from a, a kind of bird's eye view, it seems very clear that the best outcome for everybody is to live and let live. OK, this is what we call in, in uh, uh, game theory uh, the optimal outcome. Optimal is just a fancy word that means best, right? So this is the, of course, that's the best outcome. If you're looking at this from sort of out, from an outsider's perspective, if you're trying to say, here's what everyone should do. Everyone should just like, you know, live and let live. Go pick your fruit, eat your fruit, walk around, don't, don't hurt each other, right? No problem. Everybody lives fine. But of course, you're here in the state of nature, okay? And, and you know that that there's some incentive for this other person to sort of get rid of you, right? Number one, uh, they could, they could just make sure that you don't have any sort of bad intentions toward them, right? You know, they think, well, maybe maybe you're just playing nice right now until I turn my back and then and then you're going to clobber me because, you know, um, and so then you're playing all these sort of, you know, that I know that, you know, games, right? You know, so uh, so now um, it, it seems like if you if you look at it rationally, OK, um, if you choose if you choose war, OK, then they could either choose war or choose peace, right? If they choose peace, you get an easy win. OK, and if um, if they choose war, well, then at least you got a fighting chance, right? You're going to have to fight it out. If you choose peace, right, and they choose war, you're you're done. You're you're hosed. You're out of it. Uh, and if you choose peace and they choose peace, it's sort of a tie. OK, and so if you choose war, you get a win at best and at worst, a kind of tie. But if you choose peace, you get um, a tie at best and at worst, a loss. Right. And so it's either win or tie versus lose or tie. You're going to pick win or tie. Right. Right. Well, that's it. And, and you're going to assume that they're thinking of things in the same way, because, again, they're roughly as smart as you are. So the rational choice here. Right. If you're looking from the, the perspective of each of these individuals here, the rational choice is war. Right. It's it, and because you, in a sense, can't afford not to. Right, you can't afford to uh, let this other person have, in a sense, an easy victory. Right, to get rid of you uh, without without a fight. Right, and so, gosh, imagine trying to think of a way out of this situation. 
right? Imagine making a promise to this other person, saying something like, "Oh, uh, let us let us pledge forevermore to be, you know, uh, eternal siblings, and and uh, you know, I'll I'll never hurt you ever ever cross my heart, and you'll never hurt me, and then we'll all enjoy the bounty of the peace that is between us forever, right? You know, so like, look, even if you really really mean it." Can that other person trust you? All right, turn the tables for a second and imagine they say the same thing to you. They say, "Oh no, cross my heart, I hope to die. I'll never, I'll never turn on you. I'll, you know, I'm, I'm, I mean nothing but good for you. I, you know, let's all be peaceful." And uh, I mean, again, imagine they really, honestly mean it. Can you afford to trust them? Right? And if you can't afford to trust them, you'll know that they know that they can't afford to trust you either. And so it's sort of all these, you know, that I know that you know games that, like, again, even if everybody means uh, that they want peace, it's uh, the situation itself is just not conducive to that. And so this is what Hobbes describes uh, in these, these first number of paragraphs here. He describes uh, what a state of nature looks like, how all of this sort of fearful suspicion exists between people. This idea that he's like, look, you know, I mean, uh, if I if I relax from trying to gain an advantage, somebody will try and gain an advantage over me, um, and I'll I'll be hosed, right? And so I I pretty much have to always be on the defensive, and sometimes that means being on the offensive in order to uh, you know preemptively uh, uh, prevent any threat to my very existence, um, and that's all that it is is people you know sort of caring about their lives. So if you look at this situation for a second, and think to yourself, you know you know is this um, what is Hobbes saying about human nature? So far, what makes all this work is just plain old rationality and a desire for self-preservation. I mean, is it evil for people to want to live, uh, for people to want to prevent their being murdered by other people? All right? Is that is that is that bad? <laughs> you know, uh, is it bad that they'll think, well, gosh, you know, if I, you know, I have these sorts of options, they have these sorts of options, they'll evaluate their options more or less like I'll evaluate mine. Uh, without any rules, without anybody to stop anybody from doing anything, uh, can I really trust them? Can I afford to, you know, sort of, w would I stake my life on betting that they really are, uh, you know, up to up to good things? Um, again, I don't know that this is particularly bleak. This doesn't look like a, a very negative uh, idea of human nature to me. It just says people are rational, they'll try and protect their own lives, and they will follow the kinds of incentives that the situation that they are in uh, uh, permits. Okay. So take a look at this situation here. In this situation, we see that the rational choice for both individuals, that is the choice of war, uh, will get them really the worst outcome on the board, all things considered, and will prevent them from getting the best outcome on the board, which is this live and let live. Right. So that's an interesting kind of situation. Some people call this situation a Hobbesian trap, and others call it a prisoner's dilemma. Right. So it's usually called a prisoner's dilemma, a situation like this one, because of the example that's usually used to explain it, right? Uh, so a prisoner's dilemma, classically, if you've ever turned on the television, you've probably seen a cop show of one kind or another. And so based on all of this knowledge from television uh, and movies and things like that, so imagine the police believe that these two people, right, two people have have cooperated uh, in the commission of some crime, right? They were in cahoots with each other, okay? Now, how, notice, uh, you think they, that, you know, that you, you, you're just really convinced as the investigator, you know, you think they, they, you know, they really did cooperate, but you don't have any evidence, okay? So what are you going to do? Right. Well, the classic move is to bring them both in for questioning and to put them into different rooms. Right. And to tell each of them, you say, look, we know you were in cahoots with this other one. You, we know you, you, you cahooted all over the place. Right. And, um, and, and they, right. They're, they're singing like a bird in some other room. They're, they're sending you down the river. They're giving us all the evidence because, uh, you know, basically you give them both the same deal. You say, okay, uh, whichever of you gives up the other guy, right, is going to be the one that gets a nice deal for your cooperation, and then they go away to prison for a long, long time for the crime, right? But you say, look, if you wait until they give us all the evidence, well, you're just out of luck, right? And uh, you, again, you just tell them both that, and you tell them that in isolation, and essentially they have the same kind of choice that we saw with the two individuals on the last slide. They can choose war, right, that is to turn on each other, or they can choose peace, to cooperate with each other. 
And so if they continue their cooperation, if they both stay silent, they actually both get the best deal because they both go free because, you know, you don't really, <laughs> the cops don't really have anything on them. But if one of them does turn on the other one, well, now all of a sudden the cop has something, one of them gets the easy deal and the other one goes away for a long time, right? And so the idea is that they both have this 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 dilemma, right? They say, okay, well, look, if uh, you know if, if they rat me out first, well, then I'm getting the worst end of the deal. If I rat them off first, at least I'm getting the better end of a deal. And uh, you know they have every reason to rat me out, and because I and I know that because I have every reason to rat them out. And so then it, what ends up happening is they both decide correctly that the rational course of action is to turn on the other one to rat them out. And uh, then they both rat each other out. They both go to prison. Uh, and uh, when, when, when honestly the best outcome for the both of them would be to just sort of stay quiet, right? Choose the peace option, the cooperate option, okay? And that's why this, this kind of a situation is often called a prisoner's dilemma because of the example that we usually explain it with. But the formal definition here of a prisoner's dilemma, a prisoner's dilemma is any situation in which the individually rational decision leads people to get the overall worst outcome in a situation, right? That's what makes it a prisoner's dilemma, where, where the rational call by either side is something that gives them the, uh, the absolutely not best outcome, right? Uh, oftentimes the worst outcome. And of course, the prisoner's dilemma has many, many applications to uh, social and political life. Uh, you can find prisoner's dilemmas literally all over the place, okay? Um, so uh, for example, uh, you might say, uh, you imagine something that's called uh, the tragedy of the commons is really just a prisoner's d dilemma writ large. Imagine you're a shepherd, okay? You have a herd of sheep and you have a couple of choices. You can uh, graze your sheep on your own little plot of grass that, that is yours, you have it, you own it. Or there's this common land that doesn't really belong to anybody, or, or rather belongs to everybody. It's, it's common land. Like I said, it doesn't, you know, it's, it's, it's public land in some sense. And it's got plenty of good, nice grass over there. And so where are you going to graze your sheep? What's the rational thing to do? To use up your own resource or to use this public resource, right? So that you can save your own resources for perhaps later. Well, obviously, if there's a free resource and a resource that you have to maintain, you should choose the free one, right? That seems rational. But of course, what does every other shepherd decide to do? Well, the same thing. And so because every one of them makes the rational decision from their own point of view, they end up overgrazing the commons. It gets destroyed. And then, of course, uh, everybody lacks a resource that they used to have and then has to fall back on their own private resources. And so that's what's called the tragedy of the commons. It's a large scale prisoner's dilemma. And again, uh, you, you see it all over the place. If you look at the, uh, the the national budget, for example, you see a kind of prisoner's dilemma, right? Uh, or a kind of tragedy of the commons. Everybody, every, every congressperson has an incentive to get money out of the federal budget and into their districts in the form of government spending, right? That's good for them. Everybody has a disincentive to get money out of their districts and into the federal budget. That's that's taxes, okay? Uh, that, that tends to not go well in terms of elections or whatever. And uh, so what ends up happening is that uh, uh, people all end up sort of taxed rather too little and uh, and the government ends up spending rather too much uh, because, you know, that everybody responds to the individual incentives they have, even though it would be better for everybody, it would be best for everybody uh, if 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 the government did have enough money and, uh, you know, and uh, and didn't spend so very much money, right? That's uh, the, the basic idea. And again, you can find example after example after example after example. Uh, the prisoner's dilemma is a, is a big major concept in uh, social and political life. But how do we get out of it? That's the real question. So uh, here's what Hobbes has described, right? So you see this um, you see this prisoner's dilemma, and this is this is what the state of nature is like. Uh, and if you remember no other quote from Hobbes, remember this one. This is the famous, famous quote from Hobbes. People will not believe that you have read or heard of any Hobbes if you can't at least give them that uh, the the bit that's in blue here at the end. Okay. So here's here's his final description of what the state of nature really looks like due to the the fact that you're just sort of in a, a big giant prisoner's dilemma with each person that you meet. He says. Therefore, whatever results from a time of war, when everyone is enemy to everyone else, also results from a time when people live with no other security but what their own strength and ingenuity provides them with. In such conditions, there is no place for hard work because there is no assurance that it will yield results. 
and consequently no cultivation of the earth, no navigation or use of materials that can be imported by sea, no construction of large buildings, no machines for moving things that require much force, no knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no practical skills, no literature or scholarship, no society, and worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death. And the life of man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Okay, again, very, very famous quote. If you don't at least have that solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short business, nobody will believe that you know anything about Hobbes. Okay, uh, so famous is that quotation. But here we find ourselves essentially in step two of our thought process of the state of, or, or of the, the social contract theory. One is imagine a state of nature, and two, start listing its problems. This is a listing of its problems, right? Because you can't trust anybody for any reason for any length of time in the state of nature, in this sort of prisoner, this large scale prisoner's dilemma that you would find yourself in, all of the benefits of society are closed to us. The benefits of society require cooperation. They require people to work together. They require people not to be suspicious that everybody's that somebody's going to kill them at any time, right? But in the state of nature, you should always be suspicious that somebody might do away with you just so that they can feel better that you wouldn't do away with them, right? And again, even if you are the most peaceful person, even if everybody's the most has the most peaceful, wonderful, uh, good, you know, uh, easygoing nature that, that it's possible to have, they still have to have legitimate fears for their own lives, and they still have to take care of their own lives. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, it's it's that's the state of nature is really awful, right? If you decide in the state of nature that you want to be, you know, like a, a, a painter or whatever, well, you know, that'll work until somebody kills you and takes your paintings, um, you know, and says, well, that's that, that was an easy one. That's one more person that can't threaten me. Um, you know, uh, you can't, if you want to say, hey, I want to be a sailor, I'm going to, you know, so while you're building your boat, somebody's going to come up and kill you because you weren't paying attention. Um, and so unless you're basically just guarding your life, that's pretty much all you can do. Um, and that's, uh, that's awful. Okay, that's, a, that's no way to live. So we have all these problems here, and uh, problems need solutions. Remember, the third step of our um, th thought process in the social contract is to propose something that can make all this better, propose some function for government uh, that can solve these problems. And, and, and the problem we have specifically here is a violence problem. And so here, a little later in the reading, Hobbes uh, uh, proposes his solution, right? He says, look, if society, if all the benefits of society require some kind of cooperation, that is agreements, right? Uh, you know, that's, a, that's, a, that's another word for what he, what he says here in terms of uh, 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 covenants, right? You know, uh, he means an agreement or a promise, okay? If nobody can trust each other's promises, then you can't have a society. And so he says, what if a covenant is made? in which the parties do not perform now, but have to trust one another to perform at an appropriate time in the future. If this happens in the condition of mere nature, which is war of every man against every man, right? That's the state of nature that we were talking about. Then the contract is void if one of the parties has a reasonable suspicion that the other is not going to perform. Okay. So again, imagine you're, you're back in the state of nature. You've got your pile of fruit. They've got their pile of fruit. And you say, oh, I'll never touch your pile of fruit and I will not kill you. I promise. Right. Again, what assurance do you have that that person means it? Even if even if they really do. OK, you, you, you just can't afford to trust them. OK. And that's what what Hobbes says here. He says the one who performs first has no assurance that the other will perform later. So say you go ahead and turn your back on this person, put down your shillelagh and you know go looking for some more fruit. What assurance do you have that they aren't just going to sneak up right behind you and bop you over the head, right? That's you just don't, okay? He says the bonds of words are too weak to rein in ambition, greed, anger and other passions. Okay? He says unless there is something to be feared from some coercive power. All right, that's a, the key word here. And in the condition of mere nature, where all men are equal and are judges of the reasonableness of their own fears, there can't possibly be such a power. So he who betrays, or who, he who performs first, merely betrays himself to his enemy, which is contrary to his right to defend his life and his means of living. On the other hand, if there is a common power set over both parties, right, to the contract, with right and force sufficient to compel performance, 
then the contract is not made void by the suspicions of either party to it. So imagine that there is some common power, right? Some, some, some entity that is powerful enough uh, to enforce everybody's promises, right? To make sure that they follow through with them and that they don't break them. Well, then, then you can cooperate. Then you can trust everybody, right? Because there's some, something will happen to them if, if they don't, right? And so it's not up to you anymore. Now it's up to this other thing to enforce all that. He says, when there is a power set up to constrain those who would otherwise violate their faith, that fear, namely the suspicion that the other party will not perform, is no longer reasonable. So he who is covenanted to perform the first is obligated or obliged to do so. All right, so he sketches out then his solution here, which is a common power uh, to sort of hold everybody to their word, to enforce a certain kind of behavior. That's, in other words, a government. He refers to it as a Leviathan. So this function of government, he calls the function of the Leviathan. And I want to make it clear that a government should be more than just a Leviathan. But according to Hobbes, a government can't be less than a Leviathan. It must at least do this. So what he means by Leviathan is this common power, right, to enforce the performance of the contract, right? And, and the, the term Leviathan actually comes from uh, Job chapter 41. It's sort of this uh, monster, right? And of course, the Leviathan in our context, is its main purpose is to enforce a monopoly on violence. That is to make sure that nobody except the Leviathan uses violence for any reason. And of course, any reasonable person, in order to avoid the obvious problems with the state of nature, would agree to give up their right to use violence over to the Leviathan, right? So the idea is like, you, you, you would say something like, well, wait a second. So you mean that I can now turn my back on people and it's you that's going to defend me, right? Instead of nobody, <laughs> right? Well, okay. And all I need to do to get that kind of defense, to get those kinds of rules is just say, okay, well, I'm not going to attack anybody, right? I'm not going to use violence on my own behalf. You say, if I just agree not to use violence myself, then I'm going to have somebody who will use violence on my behalf if it needs to be done. That sounds like a pretty fair deal. Um, and that's, again, a very old kind of a bargain. It's the, a very basic form of social contract theory. And so let's see how adding a Leviathan into the situation changes the rationality of the state of nature. Now, remember, in the state of nature, we have all these different choices, right? You can choose war or you can choose peace. If everyone chooses war, they fight it out. And that was the rational choice individually. But now again, let's add the Leviathan into this mix. So uh, what happens if, uh, you know, somebody chooses, uh, you know, war and somebody else chooses peace, okay? Right, say that, um, uh, you know, you decide to choose war and, and this other guy chooses peace. Well, you kill them, you take their fruit, and then the Leviathan kills you, okay? We're going to make a couple of very simplistic assumptions here. We're going to assume that the Leviathan has one rule and one rule only, and that is no violence of any kind for any reason, okay? And it's easy just to make, an, make the example easy. Um, and of course, we're going to say they have one and only one punishment, and that is death immediately, okay? So again, very simplified, uh, but it's for the sake of the example. Okay, so the idea is that if you, you know, kill them, take their fruit, the Leviathan just kills you, right? So no benefit to you, really. Now, if uh, you choose peace and you're a, uh, uh, this other person here chooses war, well, uh, they kill you, they take your fruit, but then the Leviathan kills them, okay? Because they broke the rules and that's the way that goes, no benefit to them. If you uh, sort of both decide to fight it out, well, then the Leviathan just comes along and kills both of you. Again, you disobeyed the rules, no violence for any reason, uh, no matter what. And, um, you know, again, no benefit to anybody, right? Everyone just sort of ends up dead if you... So now, now think about it this way. If you choose war, the Leviathan will kill you, whatever the other person chooses. So what do you want to do? Well, how about, how, how about peace now? <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, it's very similar to, you know, the old uh, uh, routine from Eddie Izzard, right? You know, cake or death, right? You know, it's like uh, the right answer. Uh, cake, please, right? Um, <laughs> you, you choose between, you know, okay, you can choose war and, and just die, right? Or you can choose peace and, and then not die. Right. I mean, that's, uh, you know, and of course, the idea is you have to say, well, look, if if the other person uh, were to choose war, they're going to die. And so, you know, the, the same reason that I'm not going to choose it is the same reason they're not going to choose it. Nobody just wants to die. 
And so in a sense, as long as you can trust the Leviathan, as long as the Leviathan is in fact being the Leviathan, uh, then then all of a sudden the, the whole thing changes. You know, And now all of a sudden you can have peaceful cooperation. You can have people make promises and hold each other to those promises. Uh, you can have people cooperate. It's, it's, it's really just, it's a much better situation. And at this point, we can point out some interesting things about the social contract theory, because it is a very, very interesting theory with sort of wide ranging, far, far reaching implications uh, for our, our you know, current way of life and for you know, human history. And so one of the interesting things to point out is this, is that the social contract theory indicates that paradoxically, and this is, this is sort of strange, sometimes more rules mean more freedom, right? That's weird, right? You think sometimes they say, okay, if we're going to put more rules, we think here's more stuff you can't do. It seems like that should restrict your freedom. But if they're the right rules, it seems like your freedom can be enhanced rather than restricted. I mean, think about living in the state of nature. Technically, there are no rules, okay? And so really, you can technically do whatever you want. But the reality of the situation is going to prevent you from being able to do whatever you want. Again, imagine you want to be a painter and you just want to paint paintings and, and, and that's all you want to do. Well, look, in the state of nature, that's going to work just fine until somebody comes and kills you, right? Takes your paintings and whatever else you had, uh, or just kills you just to, just to eliminate a possible threat. They're like, well, look, if that guy stops being interested in painting, starts being interested in killing me, well, you know, better nip that in the bud right now. Okay. <laughs> Again, there's no rules in the state of nature. And so that seems, that's actually a rational way to think in that kind of a situation. And so if you want, even if you wanted to be a painter, you don't really have that, that option. That's not a viable choice for you in the state of nature. Uh, say that you wanted to, you know, again, you wanted to be a farmer. It's like, I'm going to plant some crops and then someone's going to kill me and then take them uh, uh, while I'm busy, you know, working in the fields. Uh, you know, and so basically your only choice is to be ready to defend yourself at all times, right? Scrap for resources, find what you can, you can use, guard it, you know, find other threats, eliminate those threats. That's your only real choice in the state of nature despite the fact that there are no rules. But now all of a sudden, imagine there's just this one rule, no violence, just one. It seems like that should make you less free because now there are, you know, 100% more rules than there used to be, right? Used to be no rules, now there's one rule, right? Um, it's an infinite number more or something like that, right? Infinite, infinite percent more. But it seems like now you have actually much more freedom. Now you can be a painter or a farmer or a sailor or you do, do all kinds of things, right? You can make all kinds of complicated agreements and arrangements with other people, and they don't have to be afraid that you're just going to like, you know, kill them as soon as their Mac is turned um, because there's a penalty for that, right? And so again, the Leviathan is a real game changer here, okay? And, and so again, the, the whole idea of the social contract is that by giving up some of our natural freedom, we can actually have more real options, more real freedom instead of sort of technical freedom. It's like, well, in the state of nature, technically you can do anything you want, uh, but that means that you can't really do anything you want, right? Uh, we actually have to have some, some, some rule. We have to have a government in order for people to do more or less what they actually really want to do. So we get more freedom from more rules. Again, it seems paradoxical, but it, but it, uh, but it works out. The other really interesting thing about the state of nature and about Hobbes is that Hobbes here really makes some testable predictions. Okay. Now, uh, of course, Hobbes, you know, living when he lived, didn't have access to a lot of, you know, the really great, you know, data that we have, uh, a lot of the really great scholarship about human history. Uh, we have a lot of data about history, especially since Hobbes' time. Um, and so, but Hobbes' idea here, it does make some, some testable predictions. So some things that Hobbes couldn't himself have known, uh, but that we can. So first off, if he's right, if he's right about the role of the Leviathan, right, about the role of a government in sort of repressing violence in order to create society, then it would stand to reason that as governments have grown more and more powerful and well-organized over the years, over the centuries since Hobbes' time, um, and even leading up to Hobbes' time, governments were getting more and more and more powerful and well-organized. But it would seem like if you look at the big picture historically, you ought to see rates of violence get, get lower and lower and lower and lower as governments get bigger and bigger and bigger and more powerful, because of course a government has to at least be a leviathan. All right? So again, if Hobbes is right, then we should see that. Now think to yourself, is that the case, right? Is, are the rates of violence getting lower and lower and lower and lower? Now for the answer to that one, we're actually gonna, gonna wait for, for the next uh, lecture, the next reading. That's in fact in there, but, but think about it to yourself.
And of course, the second major testable prediction that Hobbes makes is that places and times with the least effective leviathans should be the most violent places and times. So the closer something is to the state of nature, the more violent it ought to be, the closer to a really powerful leviathan it has, the more peaceful it will be. Right? That's 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 the essence of Hobbes' theory at this point. And in fact, we have plenty of data about that. We there's plenty of times and places where governments have have sort of you know fallen off the map or dissolved or been overthrown. There you know there's been sort of brief periods of anarchy, uh, things like that. So are those times when you see lots and lots of violence? Meanwhile, are the places with really big, really well-established, really well-organized governments, are those also places that are very peaceful, right? And again, you, we'll, we'll wait till the next reading for the answers to these questions, but think of them uh, to yourself between now and then. Because, of course, these are testable predictions. If Hobbes is right, uh, then he, he's telling us what we ought to witness in the centuries after his writing. Um, let's see if he was correct. <laughs>